A very good morning to all our guests. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to this month's Star Life session. I'm Zaim from Star Media Group and we're really excited to have you with us today. Before we begin, allow me to share with you what Star Life is all about. As a way of connecting with you, our readers, Star Media Group presents an exciting array of talk sessions covering various topical matters of interest, from guides to leading a healthier lifestyle to meet and greet sessions with personalities. Today, we have with us Dr. Far Dr. Rika Farah and Dr. Victor Chong, both consultant plastic and reconstructive surgeons. Ladies and gentlemen, breast cancer is the number one killer among women in Malaysia. Losing one or both breasts can be really devastating. Fortunately, the option of reconstructing the removed breast is a big plus for the breast cancer survivor to restore self-confidence. Today, our guest speakers will be sharing with you everything you need to know about breast reconstructive surgery, such as the types of options available, the safety of the procedure, and what to expect if you undergo surgery. At the end of the session, there will be a Q&A opportunity with our guest speakers. Before we begin our session, just a few housekeeping rules. Please switch your phone to silent mode, and please save any questions you might have for the Q&A sessions after the talk. And now, without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Rika Farah and Dr. Victor Chong on stage. Let's welcome Dr. Victor Chong. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, good, good morning. I'm uh, Victor, Victor Chong, and uh, I, uh, I'm very surprised, uh, you know, when they told me about this meeting and I was thinking, would any, anyone actually turn up and listen to a talk on a Saturday morning, I say, I'm sure they got better things to do in a long weekend. <laughs> but anyway, it's wonderful to see people who are interested and uh, wanting to know more about what we actually do. Um, just as a point of introduction, I, uh, I've been a doctor for um, 40 years or more, and uh, I landed back in, uh, onto the shore in Malaysia back in 98. And at that time, there was hardly any reconstruction that was going on for the breast. And I was working in HKL, and I remember the first case of reconstruction was actually with our Director General, uh, Dr. Dato, Dr. Hisham Abdullah. And um, since then, things have progressed quite a bit and moved on and moved on and I've been partnering Professor Yip Ching Ha for 12 years now and, and um, things have moved on. When I first started, there were so many ladies who were like, I haven't had this done and it's all what we call delayed reconstruction. But now, majority of the cases I'm dealing with are called immediate reconstruction. There's a big difference in that in terms of the the motivation, the psychological positive approach and all this. And we'll talk, hopefully we'll have a chance to maybe answer your questions about these things uh, as our meeting goes on. And um, having to, uh, I won't say too much now, I'm going to introduce you to Dr. Rika Ichihashi, who is uh, my partner in crime with this. And uh, obviously this is almost like a beauty and a beast thing and no, no further of and then I'll ask Dr. Rika to speak to you first. It's one of his favourite things he likes to say. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, like Dr. Victor, I'm actually very happy to see uh, that people are interested uh, to learn a little bit more about breast reconstruction, um, especially on this long weekend. So without further ado, uh, we thought it would be nice um, to just give an overview, a very simple overview, so that everybody's on the same page about breast reconstruction, because there's a lot of literature and there's Google Doctor out there, so we'll just go over some basic principles. Okay, so what is breast reconstruction? And it's a very simple thing. Um, if your breast, if the breast needs to be removed as a result of a disease, most of, more often than not, it's cancer or maybe certain types of tumor, 
uh, your breast surgeon or your surgeon decides that the breast needs to be removed, breast reconstruction is simply the art or the surgery of remaking that breast mound, so that shape, to remake that shape. It's not to make that breast more beautiful, but to give you back the shape of the original breast that you have as much as possible, right? So, um, I thought this would be, oh, sorry. Okay, so for those of you who haven't seen, uh, the picture on the left is a mastectomy scar. So you can see that it's flat, right? It's flat, the whole breast mount has been removed. And if you can imagine, the skin uh, that made this shape has also been removed. Okay, so this diagram shows it, that in the event that your, the nipple has to be removed, the skin also will be removed, and the surgeon goes underneath this breast skin here to take out the breast tissue. And so this wound is stitched back together, and you end up with a line like this. Okay, sometimes it's more diagonal, of course, but then it's, a, it's basically a flat chest there, okay? So... When, when can breast reconstruction be done? So we're talking about the timing, timing of it. Um, it can be done at the same time when the breast is being removed, in which case we refer to it as immediate or primary, okay? Or it can be done months or years after the breast surgery, in which case we, we say it's delayed or secondary, right? So... Um, we go to the next. So the question is immediate or delayed and what are the differences? Okay. So we start with the top here, right? The decision. So it, with, with immediate, you already have, you understand that, uh, that the patient needs to have breast surgery. So that decision to make the breast reconstruction has to happen within a time frame. In a way, sometimes it's a bit of a pressure to the patient because they have to decide, am I going to have breast reconstruction or not? Okay, so there's a time frame there. Whilst if it's delayed, then uh, you sort out the breast surgery first and you don't have to think about the breast reconstruction. Okay, that's, that's one major difference. And, and from the diagram that I showed you, with immediate, the original breast skin is kept by the surgeon. They don't cut away that breast skin. Okay? Whilst with delayed, they cut away that breast skin to give you that flat, straight scar that I showed you, right? So this leads on to the next thing, which is basically when you have immediate breast reconstruction, because a lot of the, I mean, all the original skin is kept, the scars around the breast are going to be less because uh, we will remake the mound and then close up that incision, right? Whilst with delayed, um, we have to replace that skin. We have to bring skin from another area to remake that shape, that round shape. So, of course, your scars will be more extensive, okay? And then, as a result, uh, the cosmetic outcome in an immediate reconstruction is far more superior than delayed, okay? It also means that, I mean, for, in both situations, you may have to have a small minor surgery if you want improvement on symmetry and all that. But for delayed, you may have more uh, requirement for these minor surgeries to touch up, to make it look better, more symmetrical. Okay? Um, and the most obvious thing really is the psychological impact of having a reconstruction. Because as you can imagine, when you wake up after the breast surgery, if you don't have a reconstruction, you have a flat chest on that side, no? flat chest. And if you have reconstruction, just the appearance of the mound is enough for them to feel, oh yeah, I've had surgery, but you know, I'm still complete. That psychological aspect is there. So when some of these women who have to go on to have chemotherapy, radiotherapy, they, there are studies that show that they have better quality of life because psychologically they, they feel more complete. All right. And of course, the last thing to consider is that if you have immediate, you're having two surgeries in one sitting, right? So it's one admission and you're having both surgeries done. Whilst with delayed, obviously, you have to be readmitted again at a later date and have another general anesthetic.
Okay. So we go into some sort of the technical parts. What, how is the new breast mound made? So the types of reconstruction. So the first major group, and it's the group that uh, we in our practice prefer, is your own tissue. I always say because your own tissue has a lifetime warranty. Yeah? It, it basically lasts and, and behaves like you. So with your own tissue, we're talking about fat, muscle, and skin, which we call, medically we say, we refer to it as a flap. Okay, flap. So this collection of tissue has its own blood supply. It's like a sandwich. You've got your skin here, your fat, and your muscle. And why is the muscle important? It's because it's the muscle is the one that, has, that carries the blood supply. So obviously you imagine if you cut a piece of tissue somewhere on your body and you try and bring it somewhere, somewhere else, it won't survive unless it has its own blood supply. The reason why we can do this with a flap is because the blood supply is there, you know, nourishing that tissue there. So then we go on a little bit further. When the blood supply, the blood vessels are kept connected, that means we cut around the tissue, but we leave the blood vessel and the arteries and veins connected. We call this a pedicle flap. We don't disturb the original blood vessel, the blood supply. Okay? So for example here, and I'll talk about the different types. This is a piece of tissue, the flap that we cut from the tummy. We just cut the flap, but the blood vessel, which is here, is still connected. And then we move this flap to the breast area. So it's still connected. This is pedicle. Okay? And in the second instance, what we can do is we can cut all around the tissue, including the blood vessel. We cut it off completely. And then we move it to the new place. But if you can see here, this diagram here, uh, this little drawing here, we reconnect it to an, another blood vessel. And that is... Uh, that technique we use is microsurgery. So we have to get a microscope in, use very fine sutures, and reconnect the vessels. So obviously you can imagine these vessels are, are really tiny. So in terms of uh, blood flow, uh, survival of the flap, there are increased risks with these kind of surgeries. And it's technically more demanding, and it takes a, a longer time. Okay, It takes a longer time. So there are many flaps in our body, so many. But the common ones, uh, the workhorses that we call, that we use for breast reconstruction are from the back, in which we ca we case we call it a latissimus dorsi. And the flaps are named after the muscles. So latissimus dorsi, and I didn't put that, but LD flap, or from the tummy is the transverse rectus abdominis or the tram flap. So these are the two main flaps. This is just a little video to show. Why? Because sometimes it's difficult for the layperson to imagine how does, the, how, the, how, how does the tissue from the back get pushed into the breast? Or how does the tissue in the stomach suddenly end up in the breast? It's, Im it's difficult to imagine. So, hold on a minute. Yeah, yeah okay. So this is LD flap. So this is from the back, and that's the muscle. So we cut the muscle, okay? It's just showing cutting the muscle. And we tunnel it under this skin here, at the side of your chest here. We tunnel it underneath, and then connect it to the breast. So that's how it comes through. And with the tram flap, it's the same too. Uh, this first part just shows you know, how they, they cut the breast area. The tram flap is the same. Uh, but as you can imagine, the tram flap has a longer way to travel, right? Because you have to go underneath all this skin here to end up in the breast area. See? All the way under the skin, and then you go up here. So longer distance, right? So, and as you can imagine, the surgery is a little bit longer for the tram flap because of, you know, having to go under that skin, yeah. And uh, as the last part I talk about, I just show you the implant. With implant surgery, 
Of course, uh, in, in most parts, it, it's a uh, shorter surgery because it, uh, you, know, you don't have to remake the mound. The mound is already there and you would just basically insert the implant there. In, certain cen in most centres, in fact, in thin women, they actually combine LD flap or tram flap with an implant. Okay, because of the way they harvest the, uh, the flap or the patient's very thin, so they, they actually put, an, put a flap on top of the implant for more bulk. I hope that, that I, I chose this video because it's actually quite a nice way to just show it. So this is a diagram that shows all the different flaps that you can take in the body. And it all, see, you can even take from your buttock, you can take from your thighs, and this is the tummy, you can take from the back. But obviously, with flaps that are further away from the breast, you would have to do a free flap, which means cutting the vessel and reconnecting it in the new place. All right? And of course, that depends if your buttock has enough tissue in the first place to, put, uh, to, put, to be moved over to the, uh, to the breast area. Okay. I have to mention implants, although in uh, our practice, we, it tends to be the second choice, or third choice rather. Um, so you have two types of man-made implants, uh, tissue expanders and implants. So with tissue expanders, um, basically what it is is that in delayed reconstruction, you put these uh, like balloons underneath the skin and then over time, you see this syringe here, we actually have a little tube and so we inject fluid or saline, or salt water, into the implant to slowly stretch the skin over weeks. Stretch, stretch, stretch until it reaches the shape or the volume that we want. And then in some situations, uh, depending on the expander we use, we disconnect this and that is the implant left in there. Okay, or we, the patient has a, a small surgery where we remove this expander and put in a permanent implant, permanent implant. So implants generally now are made from silicone. Um, there was a time when silicone implants were only, uh, FDA only approved it for breast cancer reconstruction. So women who wanted to have bigger breasts or just breast augmentation would have to have saline implants. That, that was before, before the safety was proven for these silicone implants. And um, we call it gummy bear implants. So this silicone uh, that's filled inside the implant are highly cohesive. That means they're a quite a good sticky gel. So even if they rupture or break, the gel doesn't flow out. It sticks together like a gummy bear, like, a, like one of you know, those sweets. And of course, implants, they don't last forever. Um, the estimated shelf life is about 10 to 25 years. Uh, but actually out of that, maybe only about 20, 30% of women actually come, uh, will come in electively to have their implants changed. More often than not, they have issues with the implants. For example, uh, hardening, tightening, and then they f therefore they would come in requesting for exchange of implants. And the last one actually is the innovation that uh, 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 we have, uh, thanks to Dr. Victor in our practice, is fat. So um, i show you a close-up. So fat, fat, uh, we use the principles of harvesting fat from obviously like the cosmetic side of our practice in liposuction. Uh, we can suck this fat out and we process it. Here, yeah, yeah, all this, the nasi lemak, roti canai. <laughs> we have the fat here. We process it, we you know, cleanse it in a purified form and we can use this fat um, to inject it into the flap. So, for example, uh, some women, maybe the, the, the fat at the back is not quite thick enough to remake the mound. We can inject it into that flap to bulk up the flap. 
and we can tailor how we inject the flap to shape the flap as well. So this is, um, you know, this basically has really helped us because we hardly use implants in breast reconstruction. We, we prefer to use patients' own tissue. And patients themselves also, especially those who have had cancer, cancer they'd rather not have synthetic uh, implants. Okay, so without further ado, I pass over to my senior colleague, Dr. Victor, to continue on. Thank you, Rika. Uh, I'm better with a knife than with a mouse or a laptop, so Dr. Rika is going to help me with this part of it. I will have to stand here so we can um, look at this part of it. Um, Dr. Rika has, in a very brief uh, way, shown you in very detail all the possibilities. And I'm sure many of you would be like, how do you make your decisions? How do you decide which one to do? Do you just throw a dart and hit something and say, okay, we'll do this today? And there's certain, when I came back here, obviously being trained in everything, microvascular and distant flaps and free flaps, then you have to make a decision. How are you going to tackle this? Before I came back, I was working in Hong Kong with a Chinese university. And that was the first time I noticed, as opposed to in UK, where I spent 20 years of my life there, and I found that people there, they're obviously the breasts are bigger, a lot bigger often, and you, the demands for reconstruction is different, and you're bringing in bigger volume of tissue in order to make that symmetrical breast. But and then in Hong Kong, you start seeing, you know, really flat-chested women, and they are like uh, bra cup A. And here, we, some of them tell me, Doctor, I'm not A, I'm KLIA. <laughs> so it means that it's very flat, it's very small. And this influences all the ideas, you know, even if you see a breast surgeon and they say, oh, this one we can do a lumpectomy. But a lumpectomy, when you cut the tumour out and you cut the surrounding safe margin, for many women who are flat-chested, it's almost like a mastectomy because there's no more tissue there. So then it comes to a different concept about surgery and about reconstruction for me, achieving symmetry. Then the woman say, doctor, don't persuade me to make the other side bigger. I don't want, I just want the reconstruct. And these sort of things as I listen to the patients. And I say one thing is this, I, my principle in terms of decision making as a doctor and guiding the patients is I must use the same approach as I would guide a good friend or my sister or my wife even or my mother when it comes to reconstruction. It should be the same. And one of the leading points about this is what is important? Actually, the most important is to say reconstruction is not important. Professor Yip, who works with me, her work is important. Clear your cancer. And for me, my part should be smaller. That means uh, it should not be. Uh, you go for a mastectomy, an hour and a half, and then suddenly I say another eight hours to make the reconstruction, and you're very ill, and you're in ICU and all this. Uh, no, it should be quick. It should be smaller than the mastectomy. And that was my concept. Why? Not just to rush and be quick to allow very low morbidity. That means recovery must be fast. Why? Your wound healing, everything is very important. You need to go for the next step, your chemotherapy, your radiotherapy. So it's very important I don't affect the, anything that results in a delay in your subsequent adjuvant treatment. That is important. You must be fit and ready for the next step because it's all about saving lives prolonging life, eradication of even some small little microscopic deposit of cancer cells in other areas. And not as reconstructive surgeons are always say, we must not become so obsessed about what we do that we end up saying, oh, this one uh, will take you 12 hours, but I will make the best Mercedes Benz or Rolls Royce for you. I say, hey, never mind, I'll offer you a, uh, maybe call it a, a Camry, la, okay? So at least it's reliable, it's consistent, it may not be the best. And I feel that is more important. Um, you will see at the top, it talks about symmetry, talk about all that. Uh, we can bypass that and then maybe even in, uh, you know, uh, in, 
in our later F and Q and all that we can talk. But the main thing I want to talk about is the sex and intimacy. When I came back, I met many women, and remember I told you they're delayed. Now they always give me a story, and they said, you know, at one time I don't see that and so often now. But there was a time when I came back, woman who come to see me with a man, and they've got breast cancer. The man, or you know. I don't know, maybe it's our Malaysian or maybe Asian or Chinese men uh, who are very nice in the sense that they want to say what they feel they should be saying. And they say, Doctor, I don't mind, uh, you know, actually not for me, I don't mind, it's okay one, like that. And, uh, and some even go to an extent, say to the woman in front of her, I don't understand her, why so vain? That that I'm, I'm very happy that don't happen anymore. I'm afraid uh, I'm happy that men now seems to have progress on from there. But through that, if the woman makes a decision and say don't need a mastectomy, the psychological side I can almost dictate to you what will happen. The woman will recover from the mastectomy with a flat chest. This side has got a breast with a nipple. This side has got a flat with a scar the woman will not look at herself anymore in the mirror. The woman will not touch this area because the sensation is abnormal anyway. But they also feel very afraid of this. They will shower without ever standing in front of a mirror. They very quickly dry up, put their clothes on, then they go out. Which means they will not let anyone near. They will change even their sexual behavior. They told me they want all the lights off and they can't stand touching that. And after five years, the number that comes back to me and say, my husband found another one in divorce. I want to make a new breast. It is very sad. And the change, as I say, is so dramatic, so pronounced when Professor Yip and I started doing what we call skin sparing immediate reconstruction the wo and then i say i'm going to top it up by making you a nipple at the same sitting so they get up and they say oh i still have a breast and that positive uh, is so good for cancer treatment like what dr rika is saying research has shown it improves not only lifestyle i believe it improves their cancer treatment because the positive of the mind is so important now um that's how I was talking about how we decide. So on top of that, you look at you know, the risk of the patients and all that. But one of the interesting, one or two, uh, I had to just do fat and don't even do a flat. Why? They are like seven days a week, uh, yoga teachers. And I say, I don't even want to ex you know, expense anything of your muscle. You keep all your muscles and patiently using some fat to help them to get there. But I find that maybe I find my work here is easier than the work of my colleagues in America and UK. Why? Smaller breasts. And often, uh, even if you create a nipple for them, they're already very happy. Just a little bit of fullness and a, and a nipple, they are very happy. And as Dr. Rika said, the both of us, we are averse to the use of implants as much as possible. And I firmly believe it's not something that I want to encourage my own friend or family members to say, oh, just put an implant in. It's not as simple as that. There are lots of complications. The results are not so good. And often you hide it, put a bra on, you say, oh, it's not bad. But when you lift your arm up, this, this lift that doesn't move, and then this, the actual you know, shape and everything will, will change as well as it's not so symmetrical. And some may end up encouraging people to put two in. And I feel that's not the objective of reconstruction. Okay, all right. Right there. Okay, there are some cases. Uh, maybe we go to the next one. Yeah. Okay. No photos, please. Huh? No, no. Can you put the camera down? I'm sorry. No photos because you've got to respect that this could be you even. So, no photos. Now, the, yeah. Go back to uh, the second one that you do. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. So, you can see on the, on, on the right here, well, on your left. Uh, 
Um, you can see that the left breast has been uh, reconstructed. The right, the, I mean, the patient's right breast has been reconstructed. Um, and you can see the swelling, the, the nipple. Now, that nipple is made. Um, this patient uh, had the LD flap from the back. And um, that nipple is made from the skin on the back. So it has a blood supply. It is alive. And <laughs> we have funny, funny stories by patients sometimes. Doctor, can I breastfeed? <laughs> and it's like, I'm like, <laughs> I don't know whether to laugh or what when they ask that. But one of the funniest stories was when I first started doing this. Huh? I had a call, a very distressed call and from the radiotherapy and the oncologist uh, who call up. Why you all now don't remove the nipple? Because they've never seen a nipple being made. Uh, and the, by the time the patient goes to them for the chemotherapy assessment, they say, how come I got the nipple? And they called up Yip Ching Ha and, and asked her, uh, why you don't cut away the nipple? <laughs> and have to explain, no, this one is a flap. The plastic surgeon made a nipple. <laughs> okay, so you can do that. Can you imagine? You've seen the picture of a mastectomy. Now you imagine waking up with a mastectomy and waking up with this. Obviously, the, the trauma is not so much. And the woman actually feels very normal. And people worry about the scar at the back. But how many women stand in front of the mirror and can see the scar at the back? So which is why it's not such a problem. And it will become so level and totally not noticeable after a while apart from a scar. So, okay, next. All right, so these are all, and you can see, it's a different color, isn't it? Because it's a skin on the back. It, it is not that heavily pigmented color of a nipple, but it serves the purpose of having it there. And we will show you later. We even have a tattoo service to get it back to the color. Okay. Ah, you can see that with this picture, the scar at the bottom, that means it's a tram, uh, like what Dr. Rika showed you with that nice video, and it goes up there and makes the breast for you. Okay, next. Okay, so this, on the right you will see, that is a form of delay. That's what we mean. With a delay, we have to open up the scar again. We have to put more tissue in, but we also need the skin in order to get you the shape. And that, that's an example of the delay. And um, it's wonderful, I mean, to see that happening. And, and the lady, a uh, young lady who after that even went on to have another child. And I see her sometimes in Facebook and she's so fashionable and everything. It gives me that sense. Huh? of satisfaction. And I find that the most positive thing of all, not that I encourage them, but when they've had all this done, they had the chemotherapy, radiotherapy, they come back maybe a year or two later and say, doctor, my eyes are droopy, I want to make them nicer. And that to me, I celebrate it. Why? They have that gist to live for life, you know? And I support them when they say that. And, and it's wonderful to see it in them. Okay, um, where do we go now? Okay, so that's roughly what I do in order to make a nipple. But this one is a tram flap that's put up there, and this is a delayed way of making a nipple. But roughly it's more or less the same when we do it now, an immediate way of making the nipple. This was a case I did with Hisham Abdullah. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine how long ago uh, there's a doctor here and the doctor will remember A&E uh, had an operating theatre and this was where we performed our first case. Okay, now this is what we, we do with nipple now. For many years, because I also published some research papers about nipple tattooing and colour matching, all that, but recently I found a German-trained uh, obsessed person, a beautician, who is really trained to do what is called 3D nipple tattooing. Obviously, she runs a business to do, you know, nowadays I don't know why people want pink nipple la, and this and that. So she does that. 
as a living. But then she came to me and said she offered this service for free. So then I said, okay, then you come and do it in my place. I offer my clinic free to you and we'll arrange the patients. You come and do it's all free for everybody, you know. And she is very passionate to do this 3D nipple tattooing, okay. And she would spend a lot of time, uh, two hours or more, you know, to make a nipple, to balance, to make it look like a nipple. And this, uh, she made this without me having made a nipple. And she managed to do this. This is actually 2D, but it looks like 3D. And she's like so excited to see, oh, you made a nipple, and now she can make it even better. And she comes up once a month from Johor uh, with her husband, and then she will do this for me. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think. Uh, this is um, another case, and this is, say, Delayed for how many years before she came to me? Eh? When I started my practice here, 16 years without a breast. Can you imagine? She has such a big breast on that side and she's been walking around with a flat. Obviously, then it affects in terms of, you know, marital life and her own self. It's really nice to see that after having done this, her life blossomed. She's like, I joined this, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Eh? It's, um, you know, I, I'm happy to say that we don't get this very seldom. I think I had one case last year, but very seldom where people come with a spouse and the spouse like, I don't need it. I don't understand why she wants to have this and all these things. Uh, uh, but people don't. As I say, it becomes easier as I design my options and surgery to be very short, to be very simple. And all I tell them is, do not think that the reconstruction will delay your discharge from hospital. It is the same as a mastectomy. Do not think I will take a long time. Professor Yip Ching Ha will take just over an hour. Just give me another hour. And we are finished. And that's it. And for a lifetime, I think it's worth it. Okay. Then uh, again, one of the more recent cases. And that's what I mean by symmetry, you know. I always tell them, I'm not here to make you beautiful breasts. If you got big, you got droopy breasts, I make you droopy breasts. And I say it's a failure on my part as a plastic surgeon to say, oh, I can't make you a droopy breast, and so I got to operate on the other side to make that smaller and higher. Then to me, that is cheating. <laughs> to me, as a reconstructive surgeon, I take the challenge to say, if you've got big droopy breasts, I make you a big droopy breast. Okay? And that's the way I function. Symmetry. Symmetry. And not more than that. Okay. So, obviously, we cannot leave this topic without at least mentioning all the possible complications. Now, those uh, at the top would be to do with... Um, Lots of it happens as surgery and as for us based on our skill, our experience, what we do and how to make sure that doesn't happen. The one that you have to think of uh, is poor or interrupted blood supply. So basically when we lift the flap off the body, it is connected to the body by one artery and one vein. And they can be two millimetres. 1.5 millimeters, and they keep that whole tissue alive. Anything happens to those vessels, the flap can die. So it is important where we talk about skill and experience and how we do the surgery and all that is very important. Obviously, there are predisposing risk factors. They would be like heavy smoker, which thankfully not many patients I meet uh, will be that type. Or if you're long-term diabetic, all this will, we will need to take into account. But most of the ladies we, we deal with, they're absolutely fine. In fact, most of them are obsessed about supplements, not vitamins, not, you know, most people are like that. And, and some of them come to me, I remember one case, very angry. Why I get cancer? I take everything healthy. My life is so, so uh, why should I get cancer? I look at it and say, look, <laughs> you can't help it. Now, one thing I want to talk about is this uh, hardening implants, uh, the implants thing. Uh, can it go bigger? 
yeah. Until about, I would say it was about uh, 2014, 2014. Then American side declared the presence of a new disease. And this new disease is called anaplastic large cell lymphoma. It is specifically related to using implants and specifically textured implants where if you've had it for 8, 10 years and if there's any change, maybe change in shape, suddenly become tense and there's fluid inside and these sort of things, it may point towards having this called a lymphoma. And the main treatment is not very big. Like you take the implant out and remove the whole capsule, uh, the scar capsule around it. Normally, that would give you a cure. In very late, extreme cases, you may need chemotherapy. And yes, one or two have died of lim that lymphoma. But very rare. This is a rare thing that happens. But I find that increasingly for myself, there was a time at a meeting where all these breast surgeons were using implants for the breast. And when I stood here and say no implants, I use own tissue, I got shot down very badly by them. But now I find that at a meeting when I share this and I talk about no implants, people don't attack me. Because uh, obviously this is a concern to tell a woman, uh, you have cancer, it's been cut out, now I put an implant in, there is a small risk of cancer again. You know, that would be harder, so, which is why the, the argument for doing it is less, even less. But having said that, maybe in one year there's one case I would do that. And often those cases are the young ladies with genetically very strong risk of cancer. And they don't have cancer, but this is... Uh, you know, you heard of the Angelina Jolie uh, surgery. Uh, so it's almost the same. And because of that, then you've got a young lady who doesn't want all the scar, all that, and they take, they're willing to take the risk of that. And that risk, you say, well, it's very much the same as women saying, yep, I need HRT. I accept the risk of HRT. I have counselling from my professional and I will take it on. It's, it's that sort of thing with life. Like, you know, you put your slippers on, you walk out on the street, you never know what will happen to you. Okay. So, in fact, I would like to pass this to Dr. Richard to do the FAQ. We will do it together. Yeah, we'll do it together. Can I use uh, the So this is um, yeah. just on. some myths or some, well, it's like a quiz. Uh, to just go over some things to see if you manage to catch the salient points that you know um, are relevant. And I always feel that when you have this kind of session, you retain more information. So obviously the list isn't, the questions aren't exhaustive, but okay, we start with the first one, uh, which says that breast reconstruction surgery is complicated. Both surgery and recovery is longer than if you just have mastectomy. True or false? False? Yeah. True. <laughs> it will be longer. You've got to bear that in mind. And there are more wounds. There's more surgery. And as I say, my emphasis is to minimize on it. And instead of a 12 or 8 hour surgery, to make it into a 2 hour surgery. And because we share the same patient, same time with Professor Yip, while she is spending time doing the mastectomy, we take that time to do our part so that when she finishes, we are ready to do our reconstruction. That cuts it off by half the time. So instead of three, four hours, we cut it down to two hours. But yes, that's more, but it's um, not deep. We're not doing a heart surgery or going into your bowels or anything. It is just under the skin. So just to share with you, on average, on average, patients who have breast reconstruction may stay in the hospital admitted for about three, four days, five days at the most. And usually when we come and do rounds, most of them are like, Doctor, when can I go back? When can I go back? Because they're, <laughs> they're quite well after that. They're not you know, rolling around in pain. So second one, you must wait until after mastectomy before you can consider breast reconstruction. True or false? 
Yeah. Yeah, false now, but used to be true where you go to a breast surgeon, everyone will say, wait. Yeah. You do the mastectomy first. Then if you're free of disease after one year, or some will say two years, then I will send you to a plastic surgeon. Mm. Yeah? Change now because of skin sparing, immediate reconstruction. Mm. Okay, hold on. Uh, third, implants are the only option for breast reconstruction. True or false? <laughs> ah, you're very attentive. Yeah, huh? very good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, wait, hold on. It goes away. Breast reconstruction is not an option for women who need to have radiotherapy and chemotherapy. True or false? True and false, yeah. Um, in the sense that, again, it goes down to later part about staging. Uh, so there, if um, we are dealing with a woman who sometimes, you know, in this region it's very funny, you have people who will go for Qigong first. You see, it's often like this. I mean, the psychology is that when you're diagnosed with a cancer, it's a very traumatic thing. And you try and deal with it in some other way and you say, and you know how it is here the multi-level marketing and there'll be women who have friends, uh, friend, do this first. You know, you see a, a breast surgeon, the breast surgeon will tell you, you have to do this, you have to do that, you have to have the surgery, then you have to have this. And, and then you go home, you start, your, your friends, uh, it could be anyone, and it could come to you. Are you sure or not? I heard, uh, you know, there's a case, uh, did what, 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 and the cancer went away, you know. And this is a very Asian thing. When I'm in the UK, if you talk like this, people say you're gaga. But here, people are fascinated. And that's why we just passed the seven months. Huh? If you say, wow, I can feel it, you know, you're standing there. And, all the, and people are, really? Uh, you can see it? Uh, yeah, I can see, you know, you cannot see it. And people are interested, isn't it? We are, Asians are inherently like that. Things that you cannot explain, you are even more interested. Things you can explain, you say, uh, you know what I mean? And because of that, you got all these, you know, all these very funny ghost things here, la, and all the spiritual things. La. It's very common in Asia. We are very open to that idea. And that transferred on to this. When you get cancer, you're trying to do something for you. And your friends come to you and say, you know, this uh, thing uh, is actually very good, you know. I heard it's anti-cancer. Huh? You take it on. Then they say, actually, you have to buy this, it's quite expensive. You sign up a membership, la, what, 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 and that part goes. Then the other part is, uh, Qigong is very good. And every culture, whether Malay, Indian, what, 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 uh, they have their own beliefs, you know. And uh, even in Hong Kong, I had a poor lady, doctor, give me a chance. I go up to China, I'm going to have this Qigong first. If it doesn't work, I will come back to you. By that stage, it's too late. Things are ruptured and smelling. Uh, you don't do reconstruction. You cut it out, close it, and say, you know, you have shortened your life so much. What can you do? You know, and this is where this comes in uh, about reconstruction. If it's very late, uh, you can't. People who go to Bomo, who is in the Kampong for a long time, and they come, uh, and you can smell them. You know, you don't need to see them. You can smell them. Then they it's so sad. You know, something that could have a 90%, 95% chance of survival uh, as having a normal life span, you, based on your decision making, can turn that into something that you have 5% chance of survival. You know? It's a, it's a thing that ha we, we should you know, bear in mind when we talk to someone with cancer. Uh, and sometimes we try and help and say, actually, Singapore, uh, you know, I heard uh, your surgeon can do what, 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 uh, this is so common, and I'm glad with Professor Yip and I, we are well known enough that our patients go to Singapore, they say, why you come to me? Uh? No, go back to Yip Ching <laughs> You know? And it's very good because they're also our friends and they know what we do. Okay. So next is breast reconstruction increases the risk of breast cancer coming back. Uh, this is known as recurrence, and it makes it difficult to detect cancer after that. True or false? True and false. <laughs> True and false. Um, it doesn't increase the risk of cancer. La. 
but you know, people will be afraid of it and say they cannot feel it, you know. But you know, now most of the time you do a baseline scan uh, with a PET scan or a CT scan and you would still go back for your mammogram. So that, that is the better monitoring. Because we always say, uh, by the time you can feel a cancer with the most sensitive part of your index finger and your ring and your, your middle finger and you're like, be able to actually feel a little lump. Uh, by the time you can feel that, the number of cancer cells to make that possible to feel is in the region of half a million cells. Now bear in mind, one turns to two, two to four, four to eight, and so on. Eh? It would be almost half a million cells or more before you, what we call palpable lump. Eh? So that is already very big. Eh? So you're, we are trying to catch it a lot earlier. So actually, it's evidence-based. You, you know, there are studies that show that it, it, it doesn't affect the risk of breast cancer coming back, and um, screening is not affected at all. It, it's proven so. Um, so next is, only women between the ages of 21 to 45 may have breast reconstruction. Okay, those above 45 cannot. True or false? False, sir. Uh. 46, you can oh. still get. What, what's the <laughs> oldest that uh, oldest, oldest patient is, we've uh, had? Almost 70. Yeah, 70 plus. Yeah. But very fit mm. and full of life. No. Yeah, 70. 70 plus. And yeah. you know what? She teaches dancing too at the age of 70. Mm. Wonderful to see life like that. And I tell her, I say, wow, if 70, I can still teach dancing, uh, I would be so happy full of life, flying about and doing things. That's the way it should be. La. Really, that should be. And I will never compromise uh, or, or say cannot do, unless their health does not allow them to mm. do. If they're otherwise fair, uh, we always say age is a number. Oh, and finally, reconstructed <coughs> breasts look unnatural or artificial. True or false? <laughs> but can, uh, can be unnatural. Yeah, and yeah. that's why we always yeah. push and push to try and do things that will give you the best possible result. Okay. Okay. We're done. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Rika and Dr. Victor, for the very informative and insightful presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now proceed to the Q&A session. If you have a question for our guest speakers, please raise your hand and my colleagues will pass you a mic. Please state your name and we would like to encourage you to keep it to one question per person. I would like to know more about the nipple sparing mean they're keeping the nipples, natural nipples. Uh. Yes. Uh, thank you for asking that because... Uh, that is something that has moved on and uh, quite new in a way. But you see, um, we are reconstructive surgeons. Then you have the other few who are the cancer surgeons. And cancer surgeons um, has always traditionally been about cutting out the cancer. Um, but there has been a move in a different way with uh, breast cancer surgeons. They have become a, a specialty of their own. And they, they now are trained in a program and they come out with the um, qualification of being oncoplastic surgeons. That means the idea is that they cut the cancer out and they will at the same time reconstruct the breast. Now, I'm an old man and an old surgeon and we always work on the basis when we work with cancer surgeons. Our pre-operative discussion is always, uh, you cut it out. You don't worry about what I do. You make as big a hole as you feel you need to for the cancer. After you've done that, I will come in, I'll fill up your hole. 
and that was the principle. But as with this program that in a way they have developed and grow and train, they seem to have an emphasis on reconstruction. And for an old man like me, I always say when you mix cancer cutting with reconstruction all in one, uh, I always worry that the surgeon can then say, hmm, maybe I should keep some of this because that will make my reconstruction better. I worry about that. <laughs> and I, uh, if it's my family member, whatever, I would want two teams. I don't want one team to do it for me because I'm worried about that. Oh, maybe I should keep, I think this is safe. I will keep it so we can use it for the reconstruction. And the principle of, it started with, um, at one time, uh, for breast cancer surgery, the history, when you talk about old, old time Patty and Halstead, uh, those names means, uh, they say the cancer is here, cut it out. How deep do, should we go? The first one, sir, uh, you cut out the ribs, you know. Then they say, no, don't need them. It makes no difference with survival. Then they left the ribs. They cut out the muscle. The whole thing, you know, ugly and sunken. Uh. Then they say, hang on, don't need to cut out the deep muscle because it makes no difference with survival. They still die. So then they left the deeper muscle. And that has moved all the way to exactly what you just asked the nipple, because skin sparing is already a big step forward, where in the past they were taking all the skin. Then they say, research has shown it doesn't make any difference uh, to the skin. And so they left the skin. So now you have this empty bag with the thin skin and we fill that up. The nipple, traditionally, they've cut the areola and the nipple out. Now, before the nipple, they said the areola is just a piece of pigmented skin. Why cut it out? So they left the areola and cut the nipple out. Then some people say, you can go under the nipple, take out the ducts uh, and leave that skin there. And that's where you are, you are talking about. So the progress is from there. As to whether it is safe or not, I guess it depends how thin you go to it. Lah. Because obviously the milk ducts, uh, whenever you have a diagnosis of cancer, the commonest breast cancer is intraductal cancer. Intraductal means it started from within the ducts, the milk ducts. And so the logic is uh, you better cut everything out, including the major ducts uh, going into your nipple. Yeah, so that would be the safest. And I still get requests. Women will be like, oh, they can't say, no, I don't want you cut the nipple out. For me, it's not a problem. In fact, I would, for my family members, I will always say cut the nipple out because I can make a new nipple very easily. Not everyone can do that. And that's where this idea, but actually, to be honest, after you cut all the tissue out, that little thin bit of nipple skin, uh, first, many of them turn black and die. This is where I worry where a surgeon say, oh, if I make it too thin, uh, it will die, you know, and you start leaving it thicker, but you're dealing with cancer. And this is where the conflict is, uh, okay? And this is where for me personally, and, and Dr. Yip Ching Hao always say, you're old man, uh, you're old fashioned. Uh, but I'm like that. And I would say, cut it out. So Dr. Yip Ching Hao has a standard to it. If the cancer is very near to the nipple, within two centimeters, she said, cut the nipple out. But I know that research, there are many people who are like saying, it's still safe. I always like to ask them at conference, is it safe for your wife? Is it safe for your mother? I always like to ask that. I'm very bad. <laughs> okay. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, does anyone else have any questions? Please raise your hand. It's interesting, where did you hear about this uh, concept? Because it's quite uh, very clinical. Did you... Ah, internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The main thing to bear is that the practice that we have, we uh, have two teams who do surgery on the same patient at the same time. So the cancer surgeon only deals with the, 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 the surgery to remove the cancer completely, and we are only concerned with reconstruction, and we work together at the same time. 
So it's 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 a different it's a different thing with a lot of practices where the one surgeon does the cancer and then after that's finished, then they start doing the reconstruction. is different, yeah. From the gentleman at the back, uh, Ernest Yeo, Victor, can you make some comments about uh, payment by insurance companies? Thank you, Ernest. Um, this is where we struggle quite a bit. I think uh, Ernest, uh, obviously, um, we are colleagues. Uh, Ernest has been around so long and would remember the development of what is called the MMA code, uh, which predominantly is not by people who would know what is happening now, the level of work that's required and uh, the development of different new techniques and all that. And as surgeons who are in the private practice and daily have to struggle with how do you fit in charges to what you're doing. And I believe that charges should not limit my progress and my work. And that's the main thing. And because the MMA code is in such a way so built into the whole system of healthcare, and it hasn't changed for how long, Ernest? 30 years? The latest circular out on 4th of September by MOH, they say the MMA code has been discontinued. Oh, thank you for it that information. It's now the 13th health schedule. Thank you. Thank you. Because um, we have struggled so hard with this. How do you, how can I serve my patient first with a surgery, which if you were to say, oh, it's only for you, one single surgeon. One single surgeon to do that whole surgery, raise the flap, trotter it, reconstruct, close this wound, go for the water, everything. Uh, it's a lot of work for one surgeon to do. And that's why the delay, that's why the time is longer and all that. When we work together with two teams, then everything shortens. But then how do you earn from it? In the private, in the government, it's different. They got all these MOs are, people running around them. It's very different. And so this is where, what Ernest, what you say, I need to talk to you more about it. <laughs> and we pay for the assistant surgeon. Wonderful. 50%. Wonderful. Wonderful, because we've been struggling so much with this that over this um, time with Professor Yip, I developed a system. I talk to the patient and explain to them and say, look, first, you know, insurance um, has been an issue when it comes to reconstruction. And we are still at this stage, we are still pushing for reconstruction to be part of that critical illness payment, if you like. But until we get there, this is still a thing that the patient has to pay for. And what I say is that you've got to pay for Dr. Rika, you've got to pay for me, and we want to do a package because the problem is, it cannot be that every time you come and see me at the clinic, I charge you again. It cannot be that when you have a little wound breakdown, I charge you for material. I find that it doesn't work. And so I talk to them about a package. You pay me a package, and that covers for everything and that covers you even two years later. If there's any, oh, your flap, your shape now a little bit out, uh, maybe, oh, the fat has died off and there's a little bit of, and I have to top it up and everything I say is covered free of charge. The moment you, any wound dressing, anything, uh, how, no matter how many times you, and they keep coming. <laughs> it's very fun. And they'll keep coming. Doctor, I feel a new pain. Of course, because all the nerves are cut away after mastectomy. Uh, they will wake up every week with a new sensation, you know? New pain, la, new funny feeling, la, tightness. La, and they'll come for reassurance. And, you know, anyone with a diagnosis of a breast cancer or any cancer will go through at least uh, two years of what I call cancer phobia. And we become a support system, quite happily support. So on one point, it's like a service. On the other part, uh, is really to, to uh, make it a viable practice in the private side. And that's how I work on it now. And it's wonderful and encouraging to hear from you, Ernest, that uh, we are moving on in that way. Because obviously, you know, I think uh, it's, it's so encouraging to hear that that, that is official because 
I believe that that MMA has caused many doctors to compromise and become dishonest with how they try and claim because they can't earn from it. And they start having to think of way, how can I maybe put this in, put that in? And I wish that not to be there so that everyone can be honourable and responsible in how they charge. And you've got to understand the doctor's charge is not the main charge, huh? but when it comes to a total bill. Do we have any more questions? We have a lady in the back. Hi, good morning, doctors. My name is Janet. I'd just like to inquire, like, usually after a mastectomy, a patient is asked to exercise as soon as possible on the affected side. But if a lady undergoes reconstruction, what is the advice for exercise? to get back the full range of the arm. Actually, the, f the first week, you're right in the sense that there is a bit of a difference because after reconstruction, say with an LD flap, you have a wound at the back. Uh, but to be honest, the first few days or the first few weeks or week of after surgery, in the ward, uh, most women are doing the normal activities, moving around. So these kind of normal, natural movements are, are fine. They can actually do it. Uh, it's act what we usually caution them against is particularly for women who are just very active. You know, they can't wait to get back home and start doing this and that. It's mostly extreme activities like, you know, this stretching, that kind of thing, which they may find a little bit limiting in the initial period. But rest assured, by about three weeks or so, or one month, they're already pretty much back to normal. Some within two weeks already are actually doing passive exercises. It's more of concern when you do axillary surgery, so the lymph node surgery there. We don't want a con a contraction of the scar and all that. And also, when they require radiotherapy, you will need, they need to actually lift their arm here for the radiotherapy to get to that areas. So that we're talking about six weeks time. Uh, so most are back to normal activities. Uh, obviously in the first week, we don't really want them to start doing all this and gym activities. Now. But yeah, definitely you're right. There is a bit of a difference. I tend to caution them, yeah. yeah. Many of them after a uh, uh, flap from the back, an LD flap. They uh, a month later, they they are actually driving. And I always say, they will say, "Can I drive, doctor?" I say, "Well, wait till you are pain free, because I don't think insurance will cover in the event of an accident, emergency, and you are this, you are in a way inhibited in your reflex uh, because of pain." So once you're pain free, you can start driving. And most, are, I've had people who go back to the gym after a month, and they are doing all their work. Huh? It's a common question because sometimes during the initial consult, they'll say, "Doctor, how long will I take to recover?" It's such a broad question because what do you mean by recover? Skin recover, wound recover, you recover. Um, I mean just to share, like, uh, they will be coming back at one week to get a wound check. Some stitches need to be taken out. By two weeks, the stitches are taken out. But most of them, by about a month, a month or month and a half, they are, you know, back to pretty much normal, and they're ready for their radio chemotherapy. But I, ha I, ask, I, sp I speak to my patients, and I ask them, a lot of them say that it takes really two years before they completely, how do you say, they can have a day where they will wake up in the morning, have a shower, and actually forget that they've had cancer, that they have cancer, and they've had reconstruction. Two years. Um, so, you know, if you say, how long does it take to recover? It varies, so one week for wound till two years, until psychologically you've forgotten, really forgotten you've had reconstruction. So. Thank you, Dr. Rika and Dr. Victor, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, we have uh, one more question. Uh, my name is Arinda. What is the cost like? The cost uh, that I've been working on for the past 10, 12 years is 15000 for the whole thing. That means not for the surgery. 
the surgery would be um, if you're talking about two surgeons and uh, all these things, it will probably be just over half of that. Then you have the other part, which will be the follow-up, the wound check, the wound management, and the lifelong management of that. And I explain to people that that charge is just a responsible charge that you will be with us, and we will support you and take care of you from there. Because we, um, we, we have women who have had, let's say, the initial surgery, finished treatment, six years down the line, they will they happen to be in the neighbourhood, they will come and drop by and say, I happen to be here, I just wanted to say hello. You know, it's like a long, quite a long relationship that we have with our patients. They become our friends. You know, we, uh, so cancer and cancer treatment and cancer patients, it's, a, it's a, a different group, different special group of patients. Yeah. So you've seen pictures there of uh, techniques like the fat injection and shaping it and making the nipple and the nipple uh, reconstruction and the tattooing and everything. There's no added cost to any of them. Everything is uh, included. Whatever that you need, whatever I feel you need in order to make it look better, it is just added on. Uh, and there's no added charge or anything. So. It could be six months, a year later, you come back for whatever, tattooing, or as I say, if you've, even if there's a volume uh, issue or the shape issue or the scar issue, we will do it for you. We will do it again with no further charge. But, but it's not inclusive of the eye lift and all that. Lah. <laughs> that they might want to do. I actually um, had one lady who had a breast reconstruction, everything fine. And she came back for eye lift and double eyelid. I asked her, why are you doing it at this stage? She said, I'm working and I'm in sales. You know, I go to a factory and these men look at me uh, and say to me, uh, hey, send someone younger, la. like that, you know. <laughs> and so that's why she, she then, because she, active and doing a job and she wants to do well in the job, you know. It's very interesting, uh, the patients we come across. Very well, hope, hope that answers your question. Moving on, do we have any other questions? All right, cool. No more questions? All right, very well. Thank you, Dr. Rika Farah and Dr. Victor Chong for attending to our audience's questions. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of today's Star Life session. Once again, a big thank you and a round of applause to Dr. Rika Farah and Dr. Victor Chong for taking the time to be a part of today's Star Life session. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being part of this morning's event and we hope to see you again for the next Star Life session. Don't forget to pass us your survey forms as you exit. Remember, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Thank you and have a great day. <laughs>